Good morning, good morning, good morning. It is 10 o'clock in the morning. Let's get ourselves situated and seated. And yes, we're in the house of the Lord this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So, uh, hey, church is in here. There you go. There you go. Church is in here. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding you. Church is everywhere, man. So it's good to see everybody this morning, and uh, we're excited to be here, and I hope you're excited to be here too. The Lord is so good. He's so gracious, and uh, God is just so incredible. So um, anyways, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for this morning. We're in awe and in amazement of who you are, God. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you love us and your desire is for you to have fellowship with us, Lord. And that's why we're here. We're here to, to meet with you. So, Father, I pray that as we go into this time of, of worship and praise, Lord, that our hearts would be open, our mouths would be open, Lord, and that we would in, enjoy, that we would, uh, with gladness, uh, sing praises to our God. Lord, we uh, ask that you would just meet our needs this morning, Lord. Thank you that you care enough to meet our needs, that you hear us, Lord, that you care about us. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you're going to do. Bless our time of being together, Lord. May we fall deeper in love with you and deeper in love with each other. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all the saints said. Amen. Amen. Look to the right or the left and say, it's going to be a good day. day. Amen, amen. Let's worship God. Who can stop the Lord? 
Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Never kneel or bow before him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. 
break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up to break every chain. things that are pulling us down, Lord. We're asking, God, that you would come through and break it from our lives, Lord. But, Lord, we have to be willing. We have to have arms wide open saying, Lord, that I surrender to you. So, Lord, that's what we're doing this morning. With our arms wide open, we're surrendering to you, God, to who you are.
Stay. 
Jesus, thank you for being with us. Thank you for holding us and reaching down to us when we reach up to you, Lord. Even when we're not reaching, you're reaching out for us. Thank you that we can just grab onto you and just hold onto you in the good and the bad and in the in-between. Go before us today, Lord, and just open our hearts and our minds to the majesty of your word. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Be with Pastor as he brings forth your word to us, Lord. We thank you for who you are. And in Jesus' name, amen. chapter 14 going verse by verse and uh, 
Uh, my intent was to finish up John chapter 14 and talk about when Jesus told his disciples to arise and go. But I shared with you on Tuesday night during the teaching on Revelation that there was a poll that had come out that um, the Barner group had done and that it said that 37% of Christians were not going to return to church even after the pandemic was over. 37%. That's startling to me. 37%. Take 37% of your income away and, and tell me how you feel. And so, of course, my critical mode stepped in. I'm like, well, people are being lazy. They just want to stay in their pajamas and hold their coffee cups and just, you know, not get out of bed or get out of the house or anything. But then I started to really think about it. I really started to pray about it. I really started praying like, Lord, is that what's going to happen to the refuge? Is that when people can come back, they're not going to come back? What's, what's going on? And then the Lord showed me something. And I want to share that with you today. Sometimes as a pastor, one of my jobs is to encourage you, to ex exhort you, to, to kind of keep, you push, keep pushing you forward, keeping you in the race right? That's what I want to do today. I'm, I'm going to break away, and I'm going to do more of a, of a topical today, but I think it's important, and I think it's what we all need to hear. I know there was things that the Lord was showing me that had me going, eh, gosh, Lord, am I carrying that kind of an attitude, you know? It's, it's amazing what happens when you spend time with God and you get into his word. He shows you a lot of stuff. I titled today's message, Do I Have Value? Do I have value? It's like, have you ever thought about it? Who, who decides how much a diamond is worth, right? Who decided that diamonds were worth anything? Why is a diamond worth more than a little rock or pebble that you see out on the street? Why are pearls considered, some of them, priceless? Who decided that? How come a clump of dirt can't be worth money? Well, it is that that clump of dirt's part of like Pebble Beach and you got to pay $600 to play around the golf. I mean, then it's kind of valuable, right? But who decides what's valuable? Who decides? And there seems to be a trend in our culture, and you guys can all relate to this, where people are not valued anymore. Oh, they say they are, but make a mistake. Do something wrong. Say something wrong. Cancel culture will come and nail you in a minute. Oh, they're all over you, as if their trough is clean, right? I just read an article where a young lady, she's 37 years old, and she was picked to be the editor-in-chief of this magazine. And people came out against her because of something she said when she was 17. Are you kidding me? 17 years old? Who knows what? Nobody knows anything when they're 17, but these cancel culture people, they think, oh, my gosh, they said this. Is Let me tell you something. I'm different than what I was 20 years ago. I hope you are, too. I hope you've grown up, matured, rethought some things, right? Cancel culture is a sickness in society, and it's based on a false premise. And one of these days when the Lord gives me the exact way to talk about it, we're going we're gonna to talk about cancel culture, and we're going to talk about social justice. Because it's not what you think it is. It's not what's being presented out there. So there seems to be this route in life where there's no forgiveness, there's no grace, there's no mercy, there's no nothing. Mess up, you're done. But that's not God's mindset. That's not God's mindset. See, God has a totally different mindset. And so today I want to talk to you about value and how God sees value. Because that's the value that counts, right? Right? There's a song out called As You Find Me. It's one of my favorite songs right now because it just ministers to my heart. And I know Pat's probably sick of hearing it because I play it all the time. But I love this song. And in the bridge, it has these words. If you want my heart, I won't second guess because I need your love more than anything. I'm in. I'm yours. Your love is too good to leave me here. Did you catch that? I'm in and I'm yours. Some of you this morning can say I'm yours, but you're not in. You're not in. See, in is different, right? In is the opposite of out. You're in the building today. 
but if you were outside, you wouldn't be in. See, some of you aren't in this morning, and you haven't been in, and you've been fooling yourselves. But I think it's because we don't see ourselves like God does. To say that I'm in, that means that I'm coming in with everything that's in me. But I want you to understand, there's four words to start with, I in, in, that I want you to put in your hearts this morning. Invited, invaluable, influential, and invested. Those four words are huge words in the body of Christ. This morning, I want you to say, say this with me. I'm invaluable. I'm invaluable. Say it again. I'm invaluable. I'm invaluable. Now, I want you to understand something. Invaluable does not mean you're not valuable, right? It means just the opposite. The word invaluable means, it means priceless, indispensable, irreplaceable. That's how God sees you. That's how God sees me. If you remember, Jesus told a parable where he said that a hundred sheep, and one of them went off by himself. And it says that the shepherd, because he loved the sheep, he valued the sheep. The sheep was invaluable. It says that he went and got, he went and found the lost sheep. He went and retrieved it. He retrieved it because it was invaluable to the shepherd. Now, if I had a hundred five dollar bracelets and I, I lost a five dollar bracelet, I wouldn't be going like oh, wow, I've got to go search for the brace. i got 99 others, right? It's only five bucks. It's not worth much. But you have to understand is that you're worth more than a $5 bracelet. You and I are worth more than a $5 bracelet. Let me put it to you another way. Let's say you have five kids and one gets lost, right? And you're going to, I can't find so-and-so. I can't find so-and-so. Where's so-and-so at? You're not going to go, oh, well, no big deal. i got four left right? No, you're going to search heaven and hell to find that lost child. Why? Because they're invaluable to you. Your kids are priceless to you. There's nothing that a parent will not do for their child if they truly love them. You're called, you're chosen, you're capable, and you're invaluable. Do you understand that? You're called. Jesus called you by name. He spoke your name. You heard him speak your name. In the very essence of who he is, in your mind, you heard him. You heard him say, so-and-so, so-and-so, and you responded, yes, Lord, because you were invaluable to him. He called you. He chose you. And the thing is, is that you're called and you're chosen, but on the other side of the coin, some of you don't feel capable and some of you don't feel valued. You don't see that you're invaluable. Invaluable. I think it's the exact opposite of what most people feel in the church today. They don't feel invaluable, right? I mean, you got the professional you know, Bible verse quoters, they're, they're really good. They can quote Bible scripture, and they're going to let you know that you don't really know what you know and all this other kind of stuff. They're real good at it. And you have those people, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. You should know scripture. You should quote scripture. But that's not what it's about, being in the body of Christ. It's not about that, man. It's not about that. It's about belonging. It's about loving each other. It's like being with each other. It's, it's, it's coming together in fellowship and in koinonia and in, in, in love and effort and, and doing the work of Christ. But most people think they're not good enough or I'm not talented. I hear that all the time. I'm not talented. I'm not important, you know. I'm not important on my job and I'm, I'm not important at all. I don't really matter right? My past is too bad. I feel completely unworthy. I don't know enough about anything. Some of you feel like Job, sitting off by yourself in the dirt with sores on your body, scraping because of the pain that you're in. Let me tell you what the biggest lie is in the church today. Today, as of today, 
March 21st, 2021. If I'm not there, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. And that is why I think a good portion of people are not coming back to church. Right? The church made it all these months without me, and we did. We survived. None of you were here, a few of you, handful, to do what we needed to do to keep the live stream going, to do worship and all that other kind of stuff. But for the most part, people weren't here. And they feel like, you know what? They made it without me. I don't need to be there. But Paul had something to say about this in the book of Corinthians. If you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, it reads, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. And so, Lord, this morning, help us to see what the body of Christ is really about. Lord, help us to see how we fit into the body of Christ, that every single one of us here in this room this morning and everybody with an earshot of my voice is invaluable and is part of the body of Christ, and you have something for each one of us, Lord. Bless us, Lord. Teach us through your word today, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul says here, the human body has many parts, but many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a quiz. Okay, I'm going to put a picture of an animal up here, and I want you to tell me the name of the animal. Okay, so let's get our first one up. What is that? Elephant. Great. So now, if I put a picture up with a group of elephants, put the next one up, what is that called? It's called a herd. They're called, they're, I'm telling you, this is the truth. This is what they're actually called, I don't know, with, I guess with Encyclopedia Britannica, I don't know, okay? Okay, here's my next picture. What's the next one? What do we have here? What is that? A lion. A lion. Now put up the next one. Pride. Pride. Everybody knows that, pride of lions. Okay, here we go, here we go. All right, what's the next one? What is that? It's a cheetah. So what is a group of cheetahs called? No, they're not Cheetos. They're not Cheetos, right? <laughs> They're called a coalition of cheetahs. Not Cheetos, cheetahs. Okay, put this one up. What's the next one? What is that? A donkey. A donkey. Okay, what's a group of donkeys called? Be careful. <laughs> be careful with this one. What's a group of donkeys called now? Let's be careful. What do you call them? Wow. <laughs> Always got to get the political in here some way. No, what do you call a group of donkeys? You call them a pace. It's called a pace. I never knew that. I was, I, I was thinking of everything else but a pace. But that's what they're called. Now listen, here's what I want you to understand. The reason I did this is for this reason. Individually, each has one name, right? The elephant, the lion, the cheetah, the donkey. But collectively, together, they have a new identity, right? They're called a herd or a pride, right, or a coalition, or a pace. And that's the idea that Paul is laying out here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What do you call a person surrendered to Christ? Christian, right? Come on, it's okay. A Christian, a follower, right? But what do you call a group of people surrendered to Christ? The church, the body of Christ. Get it? There is no individuality in the church. There is none. People want to think there is. They want to act like there is. I don't need the church. I'll just have church with my family. You ain't having church with your family. You're really not. It's not the same. You're with your family all the time. You need to be in fellowship with your brothers and sisters. Why? Because there's accountability in this. When you're not here, I'm worrying why you're not here. Why aren't they here? Are they in trouble? Did something happen? Right? It's, it's not about numbers for me, guys. It's when I don't see you, I worry about why you're not here. And it's like, man, God, are they okay? You need to understand something. Together, we are his body. His. We're the body of Christ. Your hands, your hands, put your hands out. Those hands are for one purpose, to serve. Right? Put your feet up. Your feet are for one reason, 
to go. Open your mouths, every one of you do. Ah, right? Your mouth is there to share. And your heart is there to love. That's the body of Christ. You are an invaluable part of the body of Christ. You need to understand that. Every part of the body matters. Paul goes on to write in Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. He says, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? Think about that. Every part of the body matters. Paul contrasts the ear and the eye here. Typically, people talk about the eyes. Oh, they have beautiful eyes. Look how beautiful their eyes are, right? It's easy for the ear to feel inferior to the eye. No one cares about the ear. Nobody gives eye, eye or ear attention. They give eye attention, right? Listen, no one in love ever stares longingly into the ears, right? I mean, if you did, you'd be breaking up, right? You'd be like, man, this guy's weird or this chick's weird. What is she doing? Why are you looking at my ear, right? <laughs> no one ever has an ear-to-ear -ear conversation, right? Isn't that true? You remember the old James Bond movie? It, it was, a, it, it was it for your ears only or for your eyes only, right? It was for your eyes only. Nobody says beauty is in the ear of the beholder. Yikes, that's kind of nasty. <laughs> You've got bedroom ears, you know. <laughs> I got stars in my ears. You're the apple of my ears. I mean, think about how stupid that sounds, right? And so it would be real easy for the ear to feel inferior. I'm not that important. Everybody talks about the eyes, right? But listen, every part of the body matters. Yes, I'm cracking jokes here, but I want you to understand the importance of every part of the body. We are all different parts of the body. Paul says in verse 22, in fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and less important are actually the most necessary. I didn't give you guys this verse. All of you together are Christ's body, and each one of you is a part of it. Did you catch that? Hold, hold out your hand again. What do you think is the strongest, most used finger on the hand? Pinky. 50% of your hand strength comes from this little guy right here. Without your pinky, your hand strength is 50% less. Unbelievable, right? I didn't realize that, right? I was like you. I'm thinking it's a thumb. But I was, I was reading up, and I was looking at what doctors and everything say. It's, it's just like the big toe. You lose your big toe, man. You, you, you can't even walk. Does anybody know what the, uh, the uvo, uh, evo, uvola is? The uvola. The uvola. Anybody know what that is? Uvula, that's what it is. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> I think that was Latin, you know. <laughs> it's that little thing that hangs in the back of your throat, right? That thing that hangs down back there, that's what it is. Check this out. I never knew this. Here's another, here's another secret for you. Over the lifetime, that little thing secretes enough saliva to fill two swimming pools. Isn't that a trip? That's one of the most important pieces to having saliva in your mouth is back there. I didn't know that. I thought it was up in here. Again, I'm not a doctor. I don't know anatomy, so I'm getting schooled today too, okay? Let's talk about armpit hair, right? <laughs> kind of nasty, right? But listen, armpit hair, is a, is, it's a natural way to diffuse smell. That's really what it's there for, right? And it helps attract the mate. Like, if you're real smelly, they're like, man, I don't want nothing to do with you, right? You know, I mean, just keeping it real. Here's my point. Sometimes what you do is not as visible. Just because it's not visible doesn't mean it's not important. There's people that come here and clean this church, faithfully clean this church. They're not seen. Nobody sees them. Nobody knows they're in here. But I know. You know how I know? Because the church is clean. The church will be clean. And I go, wow. Thank you, Jesus, for their service. Just because... It's not visible doesn't mean it's not pertinent, church. We have this mindset that, you know what, I'm just, I'm just not needed. 
I'm, I'm behind the scenes and, and I'm just not needed. That's not true. Everybody is needed. Who's seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life? One of my favorite movies. I love that movie. Remember when George is going to be accused of, of stealing money when he really didn't steal it? Was that other dude, that old, that old nasty mean guy, right? And he, he's going to commit suicide because he, he's going to have the ability to take that insurance money and help out his family and pay everything off, right? But then he gets saved by that little angel dude, you know? And, and Clarence, his guardian angel, shows him something different. George said, if I was not alive, remember that? If I had not been born, none of this would have happened. But remember, when Clarence showed him what life would have been without him in that town, it was terrible. It was a disgusting place to live. You never know the impact you're going to have on somebody. I remember it was a rainy night, and uh, I was uh, working late at one of the programs that I was supervising. And uh, it was probably about 8.30, quarter to 9 at night, and I'm hearing this knocking at one of our doors, and I'm thinking, how could somebody be knocking at the door? We're supposed to be locked up tight. The gates are supposed to be closed. What's going on here? So then I hear the buzzer, the intercom get pushed, and it starts chirping, and I'm like, somebody, well, obviously, somebody at the door that doesn't have a key. So I walk over to the door, and I open the door, and there was a lady standing there in pouring rain. And she says, I don't think you remember me, Mr. Dalton. She says, but I had a son that was in here with you several years ago. I said, yes, I remember who you are. I said, please, come in. Come out of the rain. What's going on? And I thought she was coming to tell me that her son had passed away. Now, this kid was a, he was a serious gangster, man. He was wrapped up tight in an aging gang. But this dude, when he would get locked up, man, he'd lose his mind. He couldn't take it. And I can't tell you how many times we had that kid on, on, on suicide watch and how many times we had to walk him out of the program and get him back into court and, and we'd 5150 him, all these things, man. And, and I remember one night when he was really struggling and I let him out of his room because I knew he was just in there just freaking out. And we sat down and we sat down at the table and I just told him, I said, listen, man, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not supposed to tell you this, but I'm just, because you didn't initiate it. But I'm telling you right now, man, what you need is you need the peace of Christ in your heart, son. That's what you need. You need Jesus. Jesus is what's going to get you through this. Jesus is what's going to change your life. Jesus is the one who's going to put you on the path. And so I was thinking I'm going to lead him into a sinner's prayer. And he's like, okay. <laughs> this was a response. I'm like, yikes. I'm okay, that, that's not cool. <laughs> not what I expected. But I asked if I could pray with him, so I prayed with him. And my, my partner, who was on duty with me that night, um, he was behind me at the desk, and he came over to me and says, Mandy, he goes, I really think something happened in that kid. Don't, don't, lose, don't lose heart. And so a couple of weeks later, he was released from the program, and now a few years later, his mom's at the door, knocking at the door. And I'm thinking, oh, man, Mama Bear remembers how many times I would just get phone calls and find out that kids that we'd been working with had been murdered, committed suicide, or, or they had murdered. It was, it was, it was, it was a up-and-down roller coaster ride sometimes. And she says, I just came to tell you thank you. I want to thank you, and I want to thank your partner. Because what you said that night made a difference in his life. And she said, he's asked me to come and bring you these pictures. He was now in the Navy. He was married. He had a beautiful little boy. And she said, I just wanted you to know that you had made a difference. Because, see, a lot of times we didn't know if we were really making a difference because the kids were kids. And a lot of times we wouldn't see them until, you know, they were much older. Or, or, and when we would see them, they were still messed up. We just didn't, never knew. But that told me that, you know what, what we did that night, just us, Caring about one kid. There was 29 other kids in that facility that night. But he was the one who needed it the most. And we, we shared. I shared. And, and my, my buddy was kind of a, you know, teetered on. I don't know if I'm believing God or not. But, but he believed in what I was saying enough to this kid to support him. You never know what you did 
for somebody's life. You never know if you really made a difference. So as I told you, you are called, you're chosen, you're capable, you're an invaluable, you're invaluable to God's work, okay? Here's what I want you to understand, church. If you aren't engaged, what I mean by engaged is involved. If you're not serving, if you're not loving, if you're not contributing, something God wants to be done isn't being done. Did you hear what I just said? You, personally, if you're not involved, And doing the work of the Lord, something is not being accomplished. Why? Because God has uniquely called you to do it. I I wrote this down this morning because I'd fallen asleep, right? I had a restless night. First I was in bed. Then I was watching a video that, that jacked me up about evangelism. And so I went out and I was praying about that. And then I went back to bed. And then I got back up to let my dog out. And then I, was, I fell asleep in a weird position on the couch. And I woke up. My arm was asleep. And I'm like, man, I can't get, what's wrong with my arm, <laughs> you know? And, and like God gave me an analogy. He said, man, when a part of you is asleep, right, a part of your body is asleep. Like you ever had your foot fall asleep? You know how that feels or your arm or whatever? It don't work right. It doesn't work right. Listen, some of you are asleep in the body of Christ today. You're not awake. You're asleep. You think you're awake. You think you are. Well, I read my Bible. I read a book. That's not, that. no, you're still sleeping, man. Because James said that faith without works is dead. You're dead. You're asleep. You need to be doing something with your faith. And here's what you need to understand. When you're not doing your job in the body of Christ, the rest of the body has to work harder. We have to work harder. Why? Because something isn't being accomplished. A need isn't being met. A life isn't being changed. Someone's going to hell. Yeah, that's real. Remember when when Mike Mike came here, Mike Chapin, he says, you have one job to do, and that's to tell people about Jesus. If you didn't tell somebody about Jesus that day, then you didn't do your job. That's like, yikes. It's the truth. If you're taking notes, write this down. We don't go to church to meet our needs. Did you hear what I said? We don't go to church to meet our needs. That's not why we come to church. Right? We go to church to meet with Jesus On his terms, and then to meet the needs of others. That's why we come to church. See, everybody's got their church checklist. Sanctuary, cool. Pastor, kind of fat. Um, Children's ministry, small. Uh, Stage, small. Uh, People, ah, they're kind of friendly. You know, you got your checklist, man. That's not why we come to church. We don't come to church with a checklist. We come to church to meet with God. And if people would focus on that, they would come to church and they wouldn't be tripping on everybody on everything else. But what about my past, Pastor? Man, I lost my marriage. I failed financially. I failed. Man, I wasn't the best parent in the world. My past is, is not all that good. Well, here's something else for you to write down. And this one is really important. Your past doesn't disqualify you. It prepares you. It prepares you. I mean, I, I, I was a wreck when I was young. There's, there's no mistake about that. I was really messed up. I was lost. I was just, I just wanted to be loved. And I had anger like you could not imagine in my heart. I was doing things I shouldn't be doing. I was doing drugs like they were the, the, mo- the most needed thing in my life. I, I drank like a fish. I was tore up, man. And you know what's so funny is when people find out I'm a pastor. When people found out that I was a pastor... <laughs> They couldn't believe it. How could you be a person who were horrible? 
And I'm like, yeah, but that's what makes me relatable. Because I can look at the most horrible person and I can have love. That's true. I'm not even lying to you. Sometimes I have more empathy for them than I do for others because the, the self-righteous, they get on my nerves more than anybody. The self-righteous, yuck. I don't want nothing to do with you. That's just keeping it real, man. Because And why? It's not that I don't love you. It's because you have a self-righteous attitude as if you're better than somebody else. No, you're not better. If God was to look at you outside of Jesus, he'd go, you ain't nothing. It's Jesus that makes us who we are. Don't think your background, your pedigree, your upbringing or anything like that. that none of that means anything to Christ. It means nothing to him. You are a new creation. As a new creation, that means the self-righteous ad- attitude and motivation, that's got to go. Peace and love out can't be around, man. Why? Because I can't love effectively if I think I'm better. James said, do not show partiality. We're to show no partiality. None. Right? None. So what if you had a failed marriage? So what if your marriage wasn't what it was supposed to be? It doesn't mean that you can't still lead a small group. That doesn't mean you still can't be effective. In fact, you might be the perfect person to be running a small group because you're going to understand the pains and the issues that come with marriage. I don't know enough. I always hear that. Oh, I don't know enough, man. I don't know enough. Listen, if you know Jesus and love people, you know enough. Do you really think when you quote scripture at people that that's what brings them to Jesus? They come to Jesus because of you and your testimony and of what God's done in your life. I've never whipped out a scripture and said, John 3, 16, oh, I'm, I'm in. I've never, I, I, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It, it does, and don't get me wrong, Scripture is part of it. But listen, when people see who you are in Christ, that's what brings them to Christ, right? That's what brings them to Christ. Man, pastor, I was addicted to drugs, man. Man, I can't minister. Listen, your story will inspire others who are in that same predicament of addiction. I've always said this to you guys. It's not your ability. It's your availability. And we get that wrong. We think somehow it's our ability. God don't need your abilities. What God needs is for you to say, here I am, God. I don't know what I'm doing, but here I am. (laughs) I I don't know. (laughs) That's what he wants. Here's what you need to understand. Your presence matters. You being here today matters. Why? Why? Because you matter. Your worship matters. When we were worshiping today, it mattered. We were in the house of the Lord together, worshiping God, giving our best to him, singing to him from the depths of our heart, thanking him for his goodness. It's like me. You know, Sundays, it's kind of like that's the only day me and mom have just to like, we don't have nothing, right? And we don't, normally don't plan anything unless we absolutely have to. That's just our day. We're going to chill, we're going to unwind, and we're just going to be ourselves, right? And typically, it's, it, my, my, my kids will come over, my families will come over, right? And if one of them isn't there, it don't feel right, right? When we're all together, and we're all sitting around the, the table in my backyard and having fun and got the music playing, and we're just having a good time and laughing and just doing whatever, now we're complete, well, it's the same way here in the house of the Lord. When you're missing, it's, you're, it, the house isn't complete. You have to understand something. Your story matters. Your gifts matter. Your voice matters. Your generosity matters. Your words matter. Your encouragement matters. All those things matter. When you give an offering, your gift makes a difference, right? Honor the Lord with your first fruits. The, I mean, the lights and everything don't stay on magically. We have to pay bills. We live in a world where we got to pay bills. But we do a lot of other things with that money. How many families did we help last year in the pandemic? We were able to write checks like we never could write because people supported the ministry. 
And a lot of families got blessed and taken care of because of your generosity, because of your giving. We support five ministries outside of this church, and we'd want to support more. It, that, that money, the money that you give, it's God's money. It's not for us. It's never been for us. When you pray a prayer, your faith moves the heart of God. Do you understand? We have some prayer warriors here. Rick Williamson, sorry, I didn't ask permission to put your name out there, but Rick Williamson is a prayer warrior. I kid you not. That guy could come and drop off a bag to me, and he says, let's pray, right? I don't care what. He is praying. He's going to pray, right? He's a prayer warrior. Man, when you invite someone to church, do you understand your invitation could change their life? Am I right? Yeah. That invitation can change their life. When you greet, when you listen, when you open your home, when you make a meal for someone, you're showing the love of Jesus. What you do to the least of these, you are doing for Jesus. So what do you call a person surrendered to Christ? What is it? What do you call a group of Christians unified to glorify God, living for his mission, ready to do the work of the Lord? What do you call them? There you go, body of Christ, the church. Listen, if you do your part, if we do our part, think of what's possible. Think about it. We can meet the needs in our communities and all over the world. <laughs> I heard this, this phrase, and I thought it was pretty cool. We could help eradicate Bible poverty translating God's word into every language. I'm like, what is Bible poverty, <laughs> right? It's a buzzword, and it's basically saying that, look, there's a lot of countries that still don't have the Bible in their language. I think that's hard to believe, but it's true. They're still translating today. We could be a part of that. Making God's word available for free, not only for 100 million people, but for billions of people. Equip and bless hundreds of thousands of, of people in the community. How? Just by doing something simple. Sharing the gospel with hurting people, right? Taking some groceries to somebody. Man, I've always said I would love to see refuge churches in different parts of the city and in other cities outside of Vacaville and giving others the opportunity to shepherd a flock. It's a huge responsibility, but it's worth it. Mentoring high-risk kids. Wow, right? That's huge. That's how I got the job that I had with probation. I was going in and holding church services with the kids, and, we, and then we were mentoring them. And I got asked, did I want to come to work there? And I'm like, I ain't no cop. I don't know about this stuff. Right? Because I still had that street mentality in me. I was only, I'd only been working for the Lord for a year or a year and a half. See, I didn't even know what I was doing. Right? But I went in because I said, well, I know these kids need to know about Jesus. Listen, guys, I'm telling you right now, it's a beautiful thing to be able to come into a community and help. I saw AJ look at me like, what are you talking about cops for, you know? <laughs> AJ knows that I love the guys in blue, and I'll say that publicly anytime. Those are my dudes, man, because I know that they're there. They're working on behalf of the Lord. Every widow, every elderly person could have their needs met. Anyone rejected or alone could feel God's love through his people. Every foster child, orphan, have them comforted by the, a loving family. Every pregnant girl who feels scared, she should be able to walk into the church or we should be able to meet that need. Every person trapped in addiction should find freedom in Christ. Every lost person in the community could hear the love of Jesus if we would only come together and work in the body of Christ like we're supposed to. And all this can be accomplished because you saw yourself as invaluable. That's how you need to see yourself this morning. I'm going to end with this story. It's an amazing story. Babe Ruth is to this day considered one of the greatest home run sluggers of all time. 
And during his career, the great Bambino autographed many baseballs. But he only put his name on seven bats he had used to hit home runs. Only seven. Now, the dude hit 712 or whatever it was. I can't remember. 704. Because he autographed so few, each of these bats became exceptionally valuable. The first of the bats vanished into thin air, lost for literally decades. And only when it resurfaced in 2006 was its, was its story discovered. The bat had been used to hit a home run in Yankee Stadium against the Boston Red Sox on August 18, 1923. Wow, it's a long time ago. It's almost been 100 years. And was given away by Ruth's agent as a prize in a home run contest. No one at the competition got any contact information from the winner, so when he left with his bat, it disappeared from public eye. In 1988, the man who had won the bat was sick on his deathbed, losing the battle to a prolonged illness. He had outlived every member of his family and his closest friends, and the only person that was close to him now was a faithful nurse who had served him for years during his sickness before he died. The man presented this nurse with his prized autographed bat. Although this gesture came with great sentimental value, she had no idea it was actually worth anything. And for the next 18 years, she kept it under her bed. <laughs> After retiring from nursing, she hoped to open a restaurant, but she didn't have the money to do it. One day, she thought about her bat, and she wondered if it might be worth something. So she took it to a local sports memorabilia shop to have it appraised. When the owner suspected it might be the missing Babe Ruth bat, he brought in several experts. After hearing her story and carefully testing its condition and provenance, they determined it was the real deal. And in 2006, she auctioned off that bat through Sotheby's for almost $1.3 million. The woman kept only as much of the money as she needed to start her restaurant, then gave the rest to begin a foundation to serve the children Babe Ruth wanted to help at the end of his life. When a reporter asked her why she would give away so much of her money, she answered, the bat was only valuable because Babe Ruth's name was on it. Since he made it valuable, the only reasonable thing I could do was something that would honor his life. Church, if you're a Christian this morning, what makes you valuable is the name of Jesus written on your heart. And because of what he did for us on the cross, our only reasonable response is to do something with our lives that honors him. Feet, deliver the good news. Hands, offer help. To those without words bring hope to the hurting you are the body of christ and you are invaluable to god's work father thank you for your word this morning lord i just pray god that we would see that we are invaluable in your eyes that it's because of what you've done jesus that brings any value to our lives lord we come to you humbly right now, Lord, acknowledging our shortcomings, acknowledging our great need for you. And Lord, we're, we're, we repent, Lord, for our attitude when it comes to being in the body of Christ. Lord, the body can't function without all its parts. And when that part is missing, it doesn't function as you designed. And so, Lord, help us to be in, all in, God, all in. And Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.